I'm Matt McClure and this is Currents. It's the 2011 March for Life. We'll take you to a mass for those affected by abortion. Plus, from Planned Parenthood director to pro-life advocate, one woman shares her dramatic story of transformation. What uh, really convicted me to leave was seeing a 13-week-old baby in the womb fighting for its life during that abortion procedure. And we'll walk in the footsteps of someone marching in Washington for the first time. I'm just so overwhelmed at how many people are here right now, and especially that it's all young kids. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Life was very much on the minds of many people today, specifically the lives of the unborn. Just today, thousands descended on Washington at the 38th annual March for Life. And while the march might be the main event, for some there have been other events taking place around the country to observe the anniversary of the Supreme Court's 1974 Roe v. Wade decision. And that decision legalized abortion across the U.S. One event was last week's Morning of Prayerful Remembrance and Intercession that took place at New York's St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was co-sponsored by Lumina and the New York Respect Life Office. Well, many came together to pray for everyone touched by abortion. For all mothers who suffer the death of a child for abortion, send ambassadors of your mercy that they may experience the purifying and renewing powers of your unconditional love and forgiveness. This year we're commemorating the 38th anniversary of Roe versus Wade and over 53 million unborn babies have died in our country since we legalized abortion. And this service is really a way for us to join together for prayer and reparation and intercession on behalf of not only the unborn children but the mothers, the fathers, the grandparents, the siblings, the friends all of us that have been touched by abortion and we all have been touched by abortion whether we know it or not. I suggested the abortion. It was my idea. I hope and pray for forgiveness, forgiveness from her, from our child, and from our Lord himself. All the testimonies that were given were written uh, by real people uh, from their real life experience. We trust that all the laws that we have are just um, and are, in, are truly making us free and promoting freedom, um, but then we're kind of fooled with this law that, uh, that we have in our country that permits abortion. A lot of people just assume it's, it's okay. Uh, and then they experience the deep wounds that come afterwards. My dad tried to force my mom to abort me and she didn't. When I was born, I went through child abuse because of my father not want, of, you know, my mother, my mother didn't abort me, but her two previous children she had to abort. And ever since I was in high school, I just got involved in the pro-life movement. It's really a wonderful way to commemorate and do penance, and it's also, um, I think, a wonderful thing to have going for the people that can't go to Washington, to get it going in a church where people can gather together wherever they are to be able to do it and just to spend the three hours in prayer listening to the testimonies. You always think it's going to happen to someone else, never you. I felt so alone and afraid. My main um, concern is for people who are stuck in their own shame, in their own darkness, like I was for so long, and I just want, want that to, to be known, that there is mercy, there is healing, you're not alone. There are many people um, who feel alone, but we're not, you know, it, it's something that we can share and, and speak about and share the pain and the burden of it and then move on forward with God's mercy and healing of the community uh, or support around you. It makes a huge difference. Well, stay tuned. There's much more currents coming up. When we do come back, pro-lifers on the West Coast come together. We'll take you to that march and bring you the rest of the day's headlines next.
Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, a flashback to the March for Life one year ago. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, Washington was not the only place where pro-lifers were out in full force. This past Saturday, an estimated 50,000 people gathered in San Francisco for the 7th annual Walk for Life West Coast. One of the West Coast Walk's founders told the crowd, quote, We are here to break the chains of the culture of death. Among the groups in attendance, Priests for Life, Silent No More, and Students for Life of America. Bishop Stephen Blair of Stockton, California, said the marchers were, quote, bearing witness to the gospel of life. Meanwhile, from Texas, that state's governor is attempting to fast track a bill that would require women to have an ultrasound image of their, of their unborn child before having an abortion. Governor Rick Perry added it to an emergency list, a list of emergency items rather, for his state's legislative session. He said he believes the bill is a small step toward ensuring the patient understands what is truly at stake. And on the 38th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade, President Obama reaffirmed his support for abortion rights. In a statement, the president said he's committed to protecting the right of a woman to have an abortion. He also said he is committed to policies, initiatives, and programs to help prevent unintended pregnancies. Well, turning now to the Middle East, Egypt's top security official says an al-Qaeda-inspired group was responsible for the deadly New Year's Day bombing at a Coptic church in Alexandria. The official there says the, there is conclusive evidence that a group called the Army of Islam was behind the planning and execution of the attack. The bombing killed 21 people. It was the deadliest attack against Christians in Egypt in more than a decade. From England, six, Catholic, six Anglican parishes have announced that they will join the Catholic Church as part of the new ordinariate for Anglicans who wish to convert. The seven priests and 300 church members make up the largest group so far to announce their intention to convert. Three former Anglican bishops who were ordained as Catholic priests earlier this month are leading that ordinariate. Closer to home, the tablet is reporting that the Archdiocese of New York is merging its college seminary program with the one in Douglaston, Queens. That move brings together all college-age men preparing for the priesthood for the Archdiocese of New York and the Diocese of Brooklyn and Rockville Center. The merger had been discussed for several years by the local bishops and seminary staff. According to the report, the new program will begin in August with approximately 100 men. From the Vatican, Pope Benedict says no one has an absolute right to get married and that priests need to do a better job counseling would-be spouses. The Pope made those statements at his annual address to the Vatican Tribunal that decides marriage annulments. Pope Benedict also told members of that tribunal that they, would, uh, that they should avoid the temptation to grant annulments on a whim. And in another annual message, Benedict is telling Catholics online that it's not just about getting website hits. We get more details on that story from Rome Reports. Benedict XVI has asked Catholics to make their presence felt in social networks. It's a part of his message for World Day of Social Communication, in which he said there is a Christian style to using the internet. New technologies in social networking have revolutionized the way we communicate and relate with one another. The Pope called for using the great potential of the internet to satisfy the desire that all people have to communicate and to share their vision of the world, as well as their hopes and ideals. The new technologies the new technologies offer an unexpected opportunity because through them we can bring the message of the gospel to more people. New technologies offer the opportunity to meet, to create new forums for dialogue and understanding, where we can also rediscover the authentic Christian community. In the digital era, Benedict XVI is pushing the church forward by proposing a Christian style of using the internet. This means an honest and open form of communication, as well as responsible and respectful ways of using the web. In this message, the Pope speaks about a Christian style to be present online and preaching the gospel through the values inspired by him, so that it can be echoed in everyday life and brought up in new technologies. The Pope said when talking about Catholicism online, it's important to be creative, but at the same time always respecting the depth of the message it conveys. He also called for the online profiles of Christians and social networks to be consistent with Christian faith meaning their online preferences, choices, and judgments are in line with the gospel. Vatican spokesman Federico Lombardi said that the Pope did not use the internet himself, but many of his colleagues do. 
He added that the Vatican will have a new website that is likely to launch before April. And a technician in Italy is trying to make saying the rosary a little bit easier. And his solution fits right in your pocket. Rome Reports also has details on that story. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. In this ever-changing technological world, it's no wonder digital rosaries are on the rise. This little egg is small enough to fit in your pocket, take to a novena, or assist in personal prayer. This Italian electronics technician invented this device so Catholics can listen to the rosary being recited without using traditional beads. The goal is to allow whomever to listen to the rosary in any moment of the day. While more tech-savvy Catholics might opt for the iPod application, Frati's model might appeal to a more mature public that isn't interested in fiddling with a touchscreen. In the past, Pope Benedict has backed technology as a way to spread the word of God, adding that if used creatively and correctly, technology can help people meet the human longing to connect with others and share the search for goodness, beauty, and truth. If there isn't the possibility to go to church, let's take advantage of new technology to allow whomever has the need to pray. Sold in over 400 locations in Italy, the device can also be bought online, customized, and available in English or Italian. Just in time for Pope John Paul II's beatification ceremony in May, this limited edition model even has a late pontiff's voice. Padre nostro, che sei nei cieli, sia santificato. Well, stay tuned. There's much more currents coming up. Just ahead, it's a conversion that was unplanned. A former Planned Parenthood director who is now pro-life shares her story. These decisions that I've made, even the bad decisions I've made, can really, um, God can use those. Welcome back. Well, many of the women who seek abortions say they do so because their pregnancies were unplanned. But the woman you're about to meet had a change of heart that was unplanned. Abby Johnson was at one time a director at Planned Parenthood. That was until a little more than a year ago when she assisted in an abortion involving an ultrasound image of a baby in the womb. That started her on a path that eventually led to Abby becoming a pro-life activist. Now, Abby Johnson has told her story in a brand new book called Unplanned. And she recently stopped by our studios to share some of that story with me. Abby, thanks for being here today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, uh, take us back a little bit in time, if you would, and tell me about how you got involved, first of all, with Planned Parenthood. Well, I initially got involved with them when I was in college at Texas A&M University. And, you know, I was just walking through the student center and there happened to be a volunteer fair going on and there were a bunch of nonprofits there and what immediately caught my eye about Planned Parenthood was that it was just drowning in hot pink and that was my favorite color and so it caught my eye. I went over to their booth and I honestly didn't know anything about Planned Parenthood. I didn't grow up uh, around Planned Parenthood. I grew up in a small town and so we didn't have Planned Parenthood around. We didn't have any abortion clinics around and I never really talked about Planned Parenthood before and so when she started telling me about their services and what they provided, it sounded okay. I mean it sounded, sure. you know, like they provided good services, testing and annual exams and you know, they did it all for free and I thought that sounded nice and you know, when she started telling me about the abortion services they provided, you know, I kind of hesitated a little bit but she told me that their goal was to make abortion rare and that they really wanted to prevent abortion, and I thought that that sounded pretty good. Mm. Now, of course, your journey with Planned Parenthood took you from there to uh, eventually a very prominent position with yes. the group. Um, what was it, what, what kind of things did you see through your journey there, and then what eventually led to you leaving and, and kind of having this conversion of, of, your, of your thought and beliefs? Well, you know, I, I was moving my way up. I've been promised to, that eventually I would become the COO of the affiliate that I was working at, which is the fourth largest Planned Parenthood affiliate in our country. Um, and, I, you know, I was excited about that. 
I thought that I would retire with Planned Parenthood, but there had been a couple of things, several things that had been taking place at our affiliate that were troublesome for me. One was that I saw that we were starting to really focus on abortions as our main source of income because abortion is the most lucrative part of Planned Parenthood's uh, services. And, and you know, they, would, they were even willing to take a loss on family planning income because abortion was making up for the deficit. And all of a sudden it was, you know, how much money can we get off of our patients? How many patients can we get in the door? Let's up our quota for the number of abortion patients we're seeing every month. And that wasn't what I remembered our mission statement was on paper, and so that bothered me. But um, ultimately what uh, really convicted me to leave was seeing um, an ultrasound guided abortion one day in September and seeing a 13 week old baby in the womb fighting for its life during that abortion procedure and ultimately seeing that child uh, lose the battle. Obviously something that, that really changed your life. And uh, now of course uh, in, in the book you're talking about this, uh, this experience and you are, um, you actually just kind of recently uh, made some news uh, in, in uh, you know, sharing something that you hadn't shared before uh, about your own uh, personal life. Tell me a little about that. Yeah, you know, I had, uh, I had shared with, with women that would come in to have abortions that I had also had my own two abortions. But uh, publicly, I had not shared that uh, with, with anyone. I had not shared it with my parents. I had not uh, shared it with, with many other people at all, uh, my friends included. Um, and so it was, uh, the time came where I knew this was going to have to come out, and and you know I, I really prayed about it and thought, you know if I'm if I'm going to write this book, I need to be totally transparent, sure. and I, I feel like, you know these these decisions that I've made, even the bad decisions I've made, can really, um, God can use those, and right. and He can uh, use those to bless others, and so I feel like that's what's been done. Sure. What were the feelings that you experienced after after the um, these abortions? So they're just Describe the feelings that you had. The first abortion I had was a surgical abortion. I, I really was just kind of blank about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I kind of just put all the feelings, stuffed them all down. I didn't ever think about it again. I tried not to think about it again. Um, it was just, a, I just tried to, you know, it's a medical procedure. It's just a simple thing. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of like I'm going to get a do over. Everybody gets this one shot to mess up. That was my one shot. But then when I got pregnant again, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, how did I do this again? How did I let this happen? Um, I felt like a real failure. I felt like, you know, my body had failed me. I had failed as a woman. Um, you know, I felt like God had failed me. You know, how could he let this happen to me twice? Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, what type of person I, am I that I'm doing this again? You know, but I just, I felt like, well, this is the only decision, this is the only choice I have. And that's what so many women feel. Right. Um, and, and I understand that. Yeah, it's a very difficult situation. And that's uh, one thing that I always say about myself is, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a guy, so I'll never have to be in that shoe, so I don't know, in those shoes, so I don't know that I can necessarily fully understand it, but you really have to feel uh, for, for people who are in a situation like that where they feel they have, they have nowhere else to turn. Yeah. What um, do you want people to get out of the book after they turn the last page? You know, a couple things. I, I want people to feel energized. I want them to feel re-energized, people that have been in this movement for a long time. I, I hear people tell me, you know, Abby, it's discouraging. We go out to the clinics and, you know, for what? And, you know, we don't have any saves. Nobody turns around. Clinic workers aren't coming out. And I guess, you know, my thought is, you know, it worked for me. You know, and you don't know what your efforts are doing. You don't know what a difference you're making. You are making a difference, even though you may not see it. Right. And uh, that's not why we go out there. We don't go out there to see tangible results. Uh, we go out there because we're faithful. Right. And uh, so I want people to feel re-energized and know that what they're doing is making a difference. Um, and I also want them to kind of just get a glimpse of, of the people that are working inside the industry and for them to really understand that this is not a battle between us and them. 
This is not a b battle between us and the clinic workers. This is a battle between us and the sin of abortion. And that we need to have compassion on those clinic workers. Uh, we need to love them. We need to reach out to them just like we would a woman going in to have an abortion. Right. Well, obviously, a very unique perspective that you bring to this issue. The book is called Unplanned. And uh, it is uh, by Abby Johnson, of course, and it's available. Thank you so much, Abby, Thank for coming you. in. We really appreciate your time and for sharing your story with Thank us. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. it. Well, stay with us. There's much more Currents coming up. When we return, a first-timer gives her perspective on the March for Life. I think marches like this is very important just because it gets everyone aware about it and gets it out <laughs> to the rest of the world. Finally tonight, many of those taking part in the March for Life in Washington have very personal reasons for being there, including the young lady you're about to meet. She's a high school student at Fontbonne Hall Academy in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. We caught up with her last year as she prepared to march then for the very first time. My name is Emma Wolf. I'm 17 years old, and today I will be going on the March for Life. Let's go. Yeah, I'm hoping that it's a really big turnout, and I hope that everyone is as passionate as I am. I was adopted, and my birth mother had me when she was 16 years old, only a sophomore in high school. She could have easily gotten an abortion, but she didn't. I want everyone else to have that chance of life like I did. We pray in Thanksgiving for a beautiful day that we'll have a lot of support from our uh, our colleagues everywhere. You know, there'll probably be a hundred thousand people here, and see how many people really are, are pro-life. It's really the majority. Right now, we are in Washington D.C. at the March for Life. I am really, really excited about this turnout. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be this many people at all, and I'm really excited for the walk. Everyone's very enthusiastic about it. Everyone has signs, and there's just a really good feeling here that everyone's really for this. My name is Brita Connolly. I'm a teacher at Fontbonne Hall Academy, and I'm also the moderator of the Friends for a Life Club. I personally have been coming to the march for the past six years with students from Fontbonne Hall Academy in Brooklyn, and every year I feel more energized and encouraged by the numbers of people, the young people that come to speak out on behalf of uh, the unborn. I think marches like this is very important just because it gets everyone aware about it and gets it out <laughs> to the rest of the world. We have the gift of purity, guys. <laughs> Valentine's Day is coming up. Give the gift of purity. We also have... <laughs> I'm just so overwhelmed at how many people are here right now, and especially that it's all young kids. <laughs> people actually care and that there's hope for future generations. Well, at least you tried. At least she wasn't like, oh, okay, now you're blindly believable. Like, at least this sign right here that a lot of people are carrying around, I find very interesting because people usually don't consider men when they think of abortion. They only think of women. So I'm really happy to see something like that. And I think it's really good for everyone else to see as well. I think Obama will really see this and take it into a lot of consideration because of how many supporters there are out here. I think the march was really good for everyone who came and hopefully it's a success so people do realize how important pro-life is. Sometimes I think that young people in particular feel as if they are, you know, a single voice crying out in the wilderness. And in fact, 
when they come to an event like this, they see that they are not alone, that there is a swelling of a desire for the protection of life throughout the country, and I think they're going to be energized by it when they take the message back to the other girls at Fon Fon Hall Academy. Well, coming up tomorrow night, Currents will take you to the 38th annual March for Life through the eyes of two young men marching for the very first time and women who share their experience from abortion to advocacy for life. We'll have that and more coming up tomorrow night here on the show. But until then, be sure to check us out online. We're over at CurrentsNY.net. We're also on Facebook and Twitter on the World Wide Web. Also, if you have a question, comment, story idea, maybe you just want to send us an email and just to say hi. Say hi, let us know you're out there watching at drop us a line at CurrentsNY.net. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.